so I want to uh, welcome everybody to our third ever Hump Day Hanger presentation, sponsored by supercub.org and the Not So Straight and Level podcast. Uh, I want to take a minute to thank all of the members and companies that have supported supercub.org over these last nearly 20 years. It's your support that has kept us afloat and made it possible for us to do presentations like these. So I'm sincerely uh, thankful to all of you for that. Uh, I want to tell you about a couple upcoming presentations. Uh, next week, Airframes Alaska is hosting a virtual open house of their new Palmer facility where they make Alaskan bush wheels and all sorts of other cool stuff. And CEO Sean McLaughlin will be leading the tour for us next week. Uh, the following week, Jeff Russell and Jeff Plants will be doing a program of their amazing trip to Alaska a couple years back. And you don't want to miss either of those. If you're watching this on YouTube Live, we're going to try to watch the chats and answer questions that you may have uh, when we get to the Q&A time at the end of Mike's presentation. And if you're on Zoom, you can use the chat or raise your hand to be unmuted and ask uh, Mike your questions. Uh, also, if you're on YouTube, but while you're there, go ahead and click the subscribe button and to make sure you don't miss anything in the future. Okay. Many of you know this week's presenter, Mike Vivian. Mike spent 30 years in Alaska as a pilot and wildlife biologist working for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife. His 13,000 hours of flight time began in 1969 and continues today. Mike is a master CFI, has received many awards and recognitions for his contributions to aviation safety. Recently, you may have seen Mike hosting an AOPA seminar or co-announcing at one of AOPA's Stoll Roundups. Mike has served on many aviation boards and is currently the president of the Montana Pilots Association. Welcome, Mike Vivian. Hello, folks. Um, Al, there I am. Okay. <laughs> thanks, Steve. Uh, I appreciate it. And, and thanks to all you folks for um, coming out on uh, or staying in on a nice uh, evening. We've got a beautiful evening going here in Bozeman, Montana. It's, uh, it hit close to 70 degrees today, and this is the first time we've been even close to that kind of temperature for a long, long time. So uh, it looks like spring has finally sprung. Um, last week, you uh, many of you listened to and watched Paul Klaus's uh, program on, uh, on his 30-plus uh, years of flying in Alaska. Amazing program. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it myself. Um, and uh, Paul lives in, in one of the most beautiful parts of Alaska. This is, uh, the Wrangell the St. Elias is, is just gorgeous mountain and glaciers and uh, fantastic scenery. I'm gonna show you a little bit different part of the states today of Alaska. And um, I, one of the, the, the first place we're gonna look at is uh, the other part of Alaska that I consider to be truly spectacular for different reasons, and that is the Alaska Peninsula. And the reasons I consider that place to be very special is because of the volcanic activity, very recent and current volcanic activity. And uh, Bill Rusk uh, did a great job of talking about his, uh, his program in uh, Southeast Alaska. And I have honestly never been to Southeast Alaska. It's about the only part of the state I haven't spent uh, time in. So I'm gonna share a screen now, I think. Um, and see if we can get this going. All right. So um, I titled this Flights, Flights on the Wild Side, Wanderings of an Alaska Wildlife Biologist Pilot. Um, and this is a, a, a nice view uh, from our uh, former home in Fairbanks, Alaska on about a 60 below zero day. And uh, this gives you a little sense of the ice fog that occurs. Not a good flying day, um, but nevertheless, uh, it's just a, an Alaska thing. Um, as Steve said, I work for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Division of Wildlife Refuges specifically. So these give you a little bit of an idea who that is. Um, you know, uh, over the years, people approach you and talk to you, and you fish and game? Yeah, close enough. You know, you don't worry about it. So I don't worry about it. People say, you work for Forest Service? Yeah, whatever. Um, so anyway, a little perspective on the country. So uh, a lot of people from the lower 48 are familiar with Yellowstone National Park. And to give you a perspective, um, Yellowstone National Park is about 2.2 million acres in size. 
Now, the Wrangell St. Elias National Park and Preserve that Paul talked about last week is 13.2 million acres. And that is the largest national park in the country. Um, now, the Tongass National Forest, which Bill Rust talked about the week before, that's about 17 million acres. So for perspective, the largest national wildlife refuge in the United States is the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge at 19.29 million acres. The second largest is the Yukon Delta National Wildlife Refuge at 19.16 million acres. And one of the areas that I worked on, the Yukon Flats National Wildlife Refuge, is just over 13 million acres. So you can get a little bit of an idea of how large some of these areas are. And uh, you know, one of the one of the stories that Alaskans love to tell is if uh, if the state of Alaska were split into two equally sized new states, Texas would become the third largest state in the union. So anyway, here is a map of the 16 national wildlife refuges in Alaska. Most of these were formed by uh, the uh, National Lands Conservation Act, um, and all of the refuges were modified by the uh, Alaska National Interests Lands Conservation Act or ANILCA, um, just as the parks were and the forests were. So first one I'm gonna talk about was the first place that I worked in Alaska and that's the Eisenbeck National Wildlife Refuge down on the very, very end of the Alaska Peninsula. And um, you see that, uh, let's see if I can get this to work. Uh-oh, that isn't what I wanted to do. Let's try this. Okay, this is um, a Google Earth um, picture of the image of that area. This is the Eisenbeck National Wildlife Refuge here, town of Cold Bay. The village of Cold Bay is the, is the uh, last village on the Alaska Peninsula. If you look very carefully here, this over here is actually an island. This is Unimac Island. You can see these large volcanoes on Unimac Island but this is called False Pass. The Russians uh, called this False Pass because it didn't look initially like it was actually a passage between the Alaska Peninsula and this first large island in the Aleutian chain. Unimaca is the largest island in the, in the Aleutian chain and the very first island. And it's much more like the Alaska Peninsula in its uh, fauna and flora than, than the rest of the chain. Um, Again, for perspective, Cold Bay, here are the, uh, the latitude longitude coordinates for Cold Bay, 55 degrees north. Now for perspective, Bozeman, where I'm at, is about 40, a little over 45 degrees north, almost halfway between the equator and the North Pole. Uh, and so Cold Bay is actually quite a way south, but look at this longitude. So for example, Honolulu is at 157 five degrees further east than Cold Bay, Alaska is. So that gives you a little bit of perspective again. And um, Cold Bay is about 750-ish miles southwest of Anchorage, which of course is where we had to go to get the 100 hour done on our airplanes, right? This is, um, this is a picture of, or a, um, an illustration of the Eisenbeck Refuge. And the, and the primary feature here is the Eisenbeck Lagoon. And we've got Bristol, they call it Bristol Bay. It's actually the Bering Sea on one side and very close, uh, very short distance across the Alaska Peninsula, we have the Pacific Ocean, the North Pacific. Um, this uh, hashed area is uh, true wilderness. And this is a little picture of, uh, part, of the, part of the refuge. These are the Ogallain Pinnacles, very spectacular. This is Pavlov Volcano. Um, apparently, the people who explored this country initially and named many of the features um, weren't very creative because this is um, this is one river, this is another river. They come together. Um, they come out of two valleys. This is called Left Hand River. This is called Right Hand River, and where they join and become one is Big River. So people weren't too creative back in those days, apparently. This is Pavlov on a little angrier day. This is a photograph taken from. Uh, Cold Bay. Most of these photographs aren't mine. Um, it's kind of a mixture. The um, uh, some of my coworkers and and others. I'm a kind of a lousy photographer compared to Paul Klaus and and Bill Rusk, who are great photographers. Again, uh, Pavlov on a fairly angry 
um, day. And one of the things about Cold Bay is it, it has the highest solar insulation of any place on Earth, meaning that it has the, the greatest cloud cover. So it's beautiful country when you can see it. This is the, the crater of um, Pavlov when it's not quite so angry. Um, this is a, an image uh, of uh, taken to the west from the Bering Sea beach off Eisenbeck. And uh, this is, Eise uh, this is uh, Shushalden volcano. It's about a 9,100 foot uh, high peak, uh, right from sea level up to 9,100 feet, a very active volcano. This is uh, Isonotsky Peak and Round Top. These are the three, three of the four big volcanoes uh, on, uh, on Unimac Island. And this gives you a little perspective of what the Bering Sea looks like on many days. You see this stuff on the beach. This is uh, bull kelp, and bull kelp tends to get covered by sand um, and then rots. And so oftentimes you have to be really careful on these beaches. You can roll into a, a pit of this bull kelp where it's rotted out and turned to mush and drop a wheel in there. And uh, you can get into some trouble. The beaches generally are pretty solid and uh, you don't have to worry too much about sinking except uh, for the bulk kelp. Here's a picture. This is actually a very recent uh, image taken from Facebook of a fellow from Cold Bay who posted this about a month ago. I, or, uh, um, Shishalden volcano is, has got a, a lava flow coming from it uh, here in this really pretty kind of pretty sunset and Isonotsky peaks over there. Isonotsky and Round Top are uh, both dormant as far as we know. So this is an aerial photograph of, of uh, Cold Bay. Primary runway, runway 32, uh, is uh, over 10,000 feet. Uh, when I first moved to Cold Bay, the population was about 100, 120 people. Um, we had on the order of 11 DC-8s, Flying Tigers DC-8, um, a day coming through here, uh, hauling freight to the to the Asian market and coming back. Um, when Flying Tiger started converting to uh, 747s, um, those airplanes were capable of, of, of carrying a decent load without having to stop in Cold Bay. So nowadays, Cold Bay is the ETOPS uh, divert base. If you're on uh, twin engine uh, aircraft and you're crossing the Pacific, Cold Bay is one of the uh, divert bases that you would have. And actually here a few years ago, Japan Air took a 747-400 in here with over 400 people in it. And uh, apparently they stayed there for a few days. So um, <laughs> Cold Bay people welcomed them and took care of them. Um, this is um, a little um, gazebo that the Fish and Wildlife Service built out on Eisenbeck Lagoon so people could observe birds this is a windy place. Uh, the highest sustained winds I saw in two years I was there, two and a half years, was 102 knots. Um, and you can see here that um, for that reason, um, the thing is pretty well uh, bolted down to make sure it doesn't blow away. The reason the refuge is established is it's uh, wetlands of international importance. And you can see along here these greenish uh, bands out in the bay, those are uh, Zostera marina, which is uh, uh, eelgrass, Pacific eelgrass, and thousands and thousands and thousands of birds feed on eelgrass uh, and other critters as well. So it's very important, particularly for these birds. This is the Pacific black brant. Um, back in the day when I was there in the mid 70s, mid to late 70s, um, there was um, a population of somewhere around 200 to 250,000 of these birds, and they almost all of them came to Eisenbeck Lagoon in the fall after they uh, finished their breeding season. This is uh, looking out across uh, Eisenbeck Lagoon uh, to Frosty Peak, which is a, an inert, uh, a, a dormant volcano uh, just up the road from Cold Bay. And these birds are fascinating. Uh, their populations have dropped off probably to half that or less now. Um, but um, we would have 200 to 250,000. These birds came from um, the North Slope of Canada and the US. Uh, in the fall, they came to Eisenbeck Lagoon. They'd spend two to three months there. 
fattening up and the eelgrass is, is a very nutritious um, uh, food source for them. And then in, in early November, we'd get a large um, uh, low pressure area come down out of Russia, out of the Bering Sea. And the birds would, uh, in the afternoon, you'd see groups of 50 to 200 maybe, um, and they would, they would take off out of the lagoon and they would climb up to a few hundred feet and drift downwind and they're testing the winds. And when they got the right winds, those big 60, 70, 80 knot winds uh, pushing them south, they would launch just after dark. And you literally, if you were on the lagoon at the time or out there uh, on the beach at the time, you have 200, 250,000 geese get up all at once and launch. And they would fly direct nonstop to Baja San Quintin uh, on Baja, Me Baja Mexico. Um, it's, a, it's a five to eight day flight, depending on uh, the winds. And they did it nonstop. Those birds then would uh, winter down here in the Baja. And in the spring, they'd start and work their way gradually up the Pacific coast back to Eisenbeck and then back out to their breeding grounds. It's a phenomenal migration story. The other birds um, that are important users of the eelgrass beds um, are emperor geese. Uh, and these birds, these are uh, uh, a small um, species of bird that lives, uh, that, that nests in uh, the high Arctic in Russia and the United States are stellar ziders, named for George Steller and a famous uh, Russian explorer. And this is a, uh, an example of a small uh, flock of stellar ziders in uh, Eisenbeck. They winter in Eisenbeck Lagoon. Um, and you get two big waves of these birds of 40 or 50,000 each wave. The males uh, show up in midsummer and then the females and young ones a little bit later. And of course it is Alaska. And so the big brown bears is, uh, are a, a feature of Cold Bay. And in Cold Bay, um, most people considered them to be kind of a nuisance uh, and being the bear guy there because uh, I had a uniform that said fish and wildlife on it. Um, they were my responsibility. I mean, I'd get phone calls in the early morning hours uh, from a lady, an FAA uh, dependent and uh, her uh, first words out of her mouth as I answered the phone was, would you come and get your bear out of my basement? Um, and so those are the kinds of calls you got. And it was a lot of fun. This is called the Barefoot Inn. Uh, this used to be, it was called the Weathered Inn when I was in Cold Bay. But one, one night I got a call at about 10 o'clock at night from the bartender who is a Filipino. Uh, he got a call and he said, one of your bears is in my bar. Would you come and get him out of here? Uh, and actually, uh, there were a bunch of drunks in the, in the bar, of course, the hardcore alcoholics who lived there. And, and uh, the bear was in the bar for some unknown period of time before the bartender discovered the bar and decided to evacuate the place. So hopefully before all the drunks got back with their firearms, uh, we managed to go prop the door open and the bear left without doing any harm other than scaring, scaring the, uh, a few folks. Gray whales migrate by here in the, uh, in the spring and then back in the fall. Um, and they're, they're fascinating creatures. They bring their calves with them. Um, you can land out on the Bering Sea beaches. This is kind of a typical Bering Sea beach, a Unimac Island in the background. This is over by the end of the peninsula. And November 739 was the cub we, we flew out there. Um, this, this airplane was on 25-inch uh, Goodyear air wheels, uh, the kind of the predecessor, the precursor to uh, Alaskan bush wheels. Um, and um, this is a classic photograph taken by uh, Christine Soule, one of my former co-workers. So you've got this big male brown bear and he has a dead walrus on the beach and he's busy feeding on that. And you've got your probably a four-year-old bear here waiting for his turn and then a wolf um, waiting for both the bears to get done so he can get his, his share. And of course, and you've got the ravens and they don't really care about anybody else. They're just taking what they need. We had a, um, we, uh, uh, one of the workers out there discovered a, um, a beaked whale on a beach 
And these things smell uh, pretty stout. If you've never smelled a marine mammal, uh, you don't, is my best advice. Um, they're pretty rank. Um, and anyway, he found this thing and he described it and took some photographs and it was a very interesting thing. It had a very odd tusk uh, on one side of its jaw. Um, so several calls were made around uh, down to Seattle trying to find out what this thing was. We couldn't find it in any of our books. And eventually they referred us to um, a fellow named James Mead in Washington, D.C. Turned out Jim Mead is the curator of mammals for the Smithsonian Institution. And after hearing the description of this thing, he said, where are you and how do I get there? Uh, and he arrived the next morning on the 11 o'clock flight and uh, went out to the beach and cleaned the, uh, recovered the skeleton for this thing. It was a Steinerger's beaked whale. And it turned out it was the first intact, first intact example of a Steinerger's beaked whale since Steinerger named it on one of Vitus Bering's voyages. Um, these things, they hadn't uh, recovered a complete specimen. And Dr. James Mead recovered this thing. <coughs> Excuse me, many years later, I was walking through our um, ma aircraft maintenance facility in Anchorage and that airplane 739 was parked in there and they were taking the fabric off it. One of the mechanics looked up at me as I walked by and he said, any idea what that smell is in this thing? And I said, nope, nope, have no idea. We did uh, marine mammal surveys uh, with a P2V, not this one, but a P2V uh, Neptune that was leased from somebody in Seattle who was crazy enough to lease it to us. I didn't fly the thing. All I really remember about that is that sitting up in that bubble canopy, in that bubble nose, uh, counting walrus, um, for hours and hours and hours, uh, you can get a pretty good sunburn. And these airplanes have uh, a one-piece wing. The wing goes all the way through the fuselage here in the center. And the relief tube to relieve yourself is back aft. So, you know, you kind of wait too long and you have to slide over that wing. Anyway, we eventually uh, started using this airplane. This was a home-built airplane. It was eventually certificated by Fish and Wildlife Service. With a standard Grumman Goose, had a 30-inch plug added forward of the of the uh, center section, and uh, two uh, basically 1,000 horsepower TPE 331 Garrett engines, uh, and tons of gas. Uh, it was called the Illusion Goose. It was eventually sold and uh, into private hands, and and it was wrecked over in uh, the Middle East here a few years ago. Um, what we did was we flew looking for marine mammals, but primarily walrus uh, from Cold Bay down here on the tip of the Alaska Peninsula. We'd fly a line up to into Russian airspace, turn around, fly another line back, and we'd do this for about three days. Um, and this is what we were looking for. Um, walrus, uh, uh, they calve on the, on the uh, ice and um, they give birth to their calves on the ice. And this is where they, uh, this is a very protected area. Uh, about the only thing out there is a few polar bears. Uh, and of course, the walrus can always jump in the water and get away from them. So that's what we were counting. And by the way, if you were going to fly as an aviator, you're going to fly to Alaska and you see these kinds of things. These are walrus. This is a walrus haul out on one of the capes on the Alaska Peninsula. You want to stay away from these things because what happens is. These uh, big bulls uh, will panic and stampede if they're disturbed. Um, and when they stampede, they'll almost always kill a few walrus. And so both the state of Alaska and the US Fish and Wildlife Service oftentimes keep observers uh, around these big uh, haul outs. So, and uh, it can cost you a lot. So if you see one of these haul outs, stay a respectful distance away, make sure you don't disturb the animals. I mean, you don't wanna kill them in the first place and uh, you also don't want to get in trouble. One of the odd things, uh, experiences I had in when I was in Cold Bay was uh, I got a call from our regional office and they said, uh, we've got a cruise ship that's coming to Cold Bay and we want you to, to uh, do whatever they need to do. So they called me, the cruise ship uh, radio operator called me and said, okay, we just need a place to park. So I told them to come down here to, um, yeah, and this is my response, a cruise ship? Really? 
Cold Bay. Um, so I told them to park in Leonard Harbor. And so I took a skiff across here and actually it was a, the first day, uh, first time I met them. Um, it was a foggy day and I had to stay kind of out of the fog and I came into Leonard Harbor into the mouth of Leonard Harbor and this thing is parked there. This is a 287, 300 foot ship. Um, and these people were wonderful. This is, they're still in business. Uh, they're now, uh, this is Lindblad uh, Tours. Uh, Lars Eric Lindblad, the famous polar explorer uh, started the company. And this is the Lindblad Explorer. Um, and they're still in business uh, working with National Geographic. And these people, everything they touch turned to gold. They said, we want to see bears. And I said, it's too early. There aren't going to be any bears out. There were bears everywhere when they arrived. Um, it was the earliest that we'd seen bears come out of their den uh, forever. Uh, and everything they wanted to see, they got to see. And they were fantastic to work with. Again, this is Shishaldan Volcano over on, um, on uh, Unimac Island and uh, Sunset. And I'll take credit for this photo. This is actually my photo. But... Um, so I left Cold Bay in 1978, moved to Kodiak. Uh, Kodiak is for, further up the peninsula and Shell, uh, separated from the peninsula by Shellacop Strait. Now, my mama told me when I was a little boy that there was no such thing as a boogeyman. And it turned out that I found out that she was wrong. Um, because again, there wasn't, when I first got to Kodiak, there wasn't, there weren't any mechanics based in Kodiak who wanted to work on our aircraft or government aircraft. They just had too much to do. So I had to fly the airplanes up to Anchorage for maintenance, periodic maintenance. And I found out that up here on Shelikoff Strait, um, right where it says Kodiak Island Borough, uh, are some islands called the Barren Islands. And my mama was wrong. There is a boogeyman and he lives out there and he makes weather. It can be a really evil place to try to try to get back and forth. Um, and I can ha I have some very strong memories. Uh, one of the braver men I've ever known in an airplane was Jack Corey. And Jack asked me one time on Friday afternoon if he could ride down to Kodiak with me. I was taking the beaver back to Kodiak after a hundred hour. His daughter was teaching in Kodiak, and I said, sure, Jack. So we headed down here. I was about 700 feet under a, oh, I don't know, like 1,200-foot overcast, and uh, about a 30, 40-foot sea running up here in Shellacop Strait, and we're headed out across there in a single-engine airplane. Visibility was seven or eight miles. It was okay. And Jack was acting really nervous. Now, this guy had a lot more experience than I did. Finally, he said, could you get up a little higher? And I said, well, Jack, you know, I'm, I'm 500 feet below the clouds. That's as high as I'm supposed to get. And he said, just, just, just get up a little higher. So I said, okay. So I climbed up a little higher up at the fin of the airplane in the cloud. And I thought about this for a while. And I said, Jack, you know, um, getting 500 feet higher out here isn't going to make a nickel's worth of difference. We're going to hit that wave instead of this wave. So what's the problem? He said, I just want the waves to look smaller. And I thought, that's, um, that's reasonable. I can understand that. This is Kodiak. This is the city of Kodiak. Um, this is how it looks now, more or less. Over in the background, you see a Fognac Island, uh, or excuse me, a Fognac Island over here in the distance. And then the, uh, this is uh, one of the other islands out here. Um, boat Channel, we uh, took off from Lily Lake or, or uh, uh, Municipal Airport up here in the middle of the city. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. Landed down in the channel down here and uh, loaded passengers from the dock. Um, this is kind of what Kodiak looked like. Um, Bill Rust talked about it a little bit about Kodiak and said there are no trees, and that's pretty true. What you see is a lot of really tall grass, uh, a lot of alders, a big incised, deep incised bays. Um, I've seen folks from New Zealand come to Kodiak and they said this looks remarkably like New Zealand. This is what the interior of the island looks like uh, in the winter. Very steep, jagged. Uh, I used to say only semi-jokingly that there is no such thing as soil on Kodiak. There's only volcanic ash. Kodiak has a really interesting um, population of mammals. 
Um, the only native, there are only six native mammals on Kodiak, the brown bear versus Arctos middendorfi. This uh, is a small, it's a Clephrianimus, it's a, a, a redback vocal. Um, the red fox, this is the silver color phase of the red fox, a uh, little brown bat, the river otter, and the short-tailed weasel or ermine. So these are the only six uh, mammal species that were native on Kodiak Island. And we're not even sure about the red fox because the Russians imported a lot of red fox to a lot of islands out here. Um, but um, we, um, there were many species uh, have been introduced to Kodiak, the uh, Sitka black-tailed deer, uh, doll sheep were introduced, they didn't stick, we don't think. Mountain goats did stick, very successful. Elk, uh, and so forth and so on, many, many species. So this is the airplane, I, I, uh, one of the airplanes I flew a great deal in Kodiak, um, 720, beautiful 1969 um, Super Cub. Um, this was after it had been refurbished, after it had been recovered, and uh, Edo 2000 floats. This was parked at Carlick Lake. And, um, and um, you can see in this uh, little yellow circle, <coughs> excuse me, um, you can see in this yellow circle, <coughs> that's a little plastic um, uh, funnel. And it's attached to a long wire antenna, which goes up here and is attached to a, uh, a reel up on the left wing route. And that's how we communicated over HF radio. We'd run this 120 foot antenna out and uh, talk on it. And hopefully you were smart enough uh, to reel that antenna back in before you landed because then you'd lose the antenna. There's lots of antenna stories with these airplanes. This is uh, probably my all-time favorite airplane. Um, it, this is November 765, it's a de Havilland Beaver. This is a bone stock Beaver mounted on Bristol Arrow 4580 uh, amphibious floats. Note the position of the nose gears. Um, they retract up and over the nose of the floats and lay on top of the decks. Um, <clears throat> this is as close to a stock Beaver as you'd ever see. And uh, one of the things that you hardly ever see on a beaver nowadays is the lower air induction, which was standard on the beaver. Um, nowadays, almost all the beavers have an upper air induction up here. That was an SDC that was developed by Kenmore Air Harbor. And here you can see the, the gear in the down position. Um, this pro propeller, um, and I have to say, we were public aircraft back then. We were operating public aircraft. And the public aircraft rules are kind of, sort of, you don't have any rules. Um, so federal government, state governments uh, can choose to operate. The rules have tightened up a lot these days. But this propeller was a, a, a Hamilton Standard 2D30 propeller, but it was a foot longer than it was supposed to be for this airplane, for this application. And this airplane would really snort. If you've ever heard a Cessna 185 with an 88 inch uh, two bladed prop taken off at full lope, um, they're quiet compared to what this airplane was. Well, here's an overhead shot from Google Earth of Lily Lake in downtown Kodiak and Municipal Airport. And Municipal Airport's about 2,400 feet. Lily Lake's about 2,200 feet. So this airplane was based here, uh, the, the Beaver was based there. And there was one summer where um, I had a project and I really needed to leave early in the morning and I would launch out of there at about 5 a.m. Coming out of, coming off uh, Municipal Airport at full lope, they're 2300 RPM and just screaming. There's a, a uh, set of condominiums right here uh, and of course, I'd go buy those things at about 100 feet and in full lope. Well, it was 20, probably 20 years later, I was doing a presentation for a seaplane seminar in, in Anchorage in the Lusak Library. And I showed a picture of that, uh, that beaver uh, and a guy in the back, uh, there's probably 200 people in this place, a guy in the back said, you're the SOB that gave me the 5 a.m. wake up one summer. 
Um, and it, fortunately, I talked to him later and he was very kind about it. We were both laughing about it, but he knew that big orange airplane well. Again, here's a little different perspective of Kodiak. The state airport is back over in here. Um, but uh, again, we operated out of Lily Lake with the Cub on straight floats and uh, eventually we moved the Beaver over to the uh, state airport as well. This is the, the uh, city dock. Um, this is a floating, uh, this is a float, uh, floating ramp. Um, the tides in Kodiak are anywhere from 16 to 24 feet, depending on uh, what part of the island you're on and, and what time of the year and so forth and so on. Very big, big tides. Kodiak and Seldovia tides are huge. Kodiak's a fantastic place if you like seafood. These are red king crab. Uh, one of my coworkers and I out in my skiff, we kept a, a pot out and uh, we'd catch king crab and tanner crab. This is uh, about an 80 pound, 85 pound uh, halibut. Um, my dad's got, he came visit from uh, Washington. Uh, and of course, salmon. Um, and uh, lots and lots, all five species of Pacific salmon uh, are found in Kodiak and of course the bears. Uh, and it is all about bears on Kodiak when you're working on Kodiak. It's a fantastic place. Um, you see these guys uh, everywhere. Notwithstanding, Bill Rusk was unfortunate enough not to see any bears on Kodiak. Um, but I have said many, many times that uh, I, I seriously don't think uh, anytime you're on Kodiak Island that you're more than two or 300 yards from a brown bear. They're, they're everywhere. Um, this is a, um, an image, this is, uh, there's actually a dead whale in the water here, um, and that's what these bears are feeding on. Um, driving around here and the uh, observer's taking pictures and the observer at some point says, um, how reliable are these airplane engines? And that was my clue to leave. Um, anyway, uh, there's 44 bears in that picture near as I could tell, by the way. Um, so, you know, we're scientists, right? We be scientists and it's what we do. And so when you're a scientist, you know, and there's bears, you, you got to do a little bear science. So here we go. Um, this is a capture team, uh, the cub on the right. Um, I'd fly that, find the animals we wanted to tag, that we wanted to capture and tag. And this is Kenai Air, um, their helicopter, a Bel Bell Jet Ranger. Uh, We'd put a shooting door on that helicopter and uh, use a, a projectile, projectile a dart and catch the animals. And we were, uh, we tagged females. We were interested in the reproductive success, the reproductive rate and success of um, female brown bears on Kodiak. We worked with the state very closely with the state. So I know a lot of people in Alaska think the state uh, doesn't get along with the feds. Um, we get along great with the with the state folks down there. We worked hand in hand, and uh, we handled between the two groups. Uh, we handled uh, over 200 uh, brown bears in the course of a seven-year uh, project. Um, so we take uh, we take a vestigial tooth to age the bear, blood samples, and so forth and so on. Put a radio collar on the bear, and off we'd go. So then it was basically my job. Um, and usually an observer uh, to use the uh, DF antennas on the airplane had a, a, a switch on the stick, which would select left antenna, right antenna, or both. Uh, and we'd go out and fly. And we, we tried to locate each of these bears um, uh, at least once a week or once at least once every 10 days. And we were generally pretty successful. Of course, that's during the season when they're not in the den. Um, and this is what we were looking for. This is a female, big female with three young cubs. This is, these are pretty new out of the den. They've probably been out of the den maybe two weeks. Um, and one of the things we wanted to know was how long these females keep their young with them. Generally, the general uh, consensus was before this study that most of these bears keep their cubs with them for two years. And uh, then after two years, they run the cubs off, the female breeds again, and, um, uh, and, and then they, they uh, 
the next year they'll have new cubs again and so forth. What we found was a lot of these bears um, kept their cubs until three years of age. This is actually a female on the right, a nice adult female. She's probably 600 pounds. And this is a, an, a three-year-old male cub. And you look at him and he's almost the same size as she is. He probably only weighs 350 pounds because uh, he's pretty skinny. Um, but what we found was a lot of these females on Kodiak were actually keeping their cubs uh, to three years of age. And that makes a huge difference uh, in an animal that doesn't breed until they're five years of age. And uh, they stop breeding at about 20 years of age. Uh, so, you know, keeping cubs for three years instead of two is a, is a pretty huge uh, influence on the reproductive rate. This is a typical kind of a typical den site. Um, these these bears spend a lot of time up in the alpine, particularly in the spring and then in the fall. Um, and as I said, uh, some of the introduced species, this is a Sitka black-tailed deer, uh, very common in Kodiak. They were, during the time I was in Kodiak, they were uh, expanding rapidly on the island. Lots of hunters, and we built a number of cabins and refurbished some cabins and opened them to public use with the idea that we were probably saving bears lives by giving deer hunters some place to sleep that was fairly safe from bears. And again, uh, can be a little windy down there. Uh, you can see on the left side of the cabin, there's an oil stove. Uh, as, as Bill said in his presentation, there are no trees down here, so there's, there's no wood. Uh, and so we asked people to just bring a little bit of uh, fuel oil for, uh, kerosene or fuel oil for the stoves to stay warm. I did bald eagle surveys. Uh, we had about 119 to 125 active nests every year. Uh, and um, that took quite a bit of flying to verify whether they were active and which nest they were active in. Uh, and um, the, the beaver um, was the load carrier. The beaver was a workhorse. This is what we did most of the work with. We spent a lot of time down on the south end of the island on Carlock Lake. We had a camp down there and uh, we'd operate, we'd go down there. The weather was typically better on that end of the island. So we'd go down there and spend four or five days, get a bunch of work done on the south end of the island uh, and then come back to Kodiak when the weather was good enough. So we needed fuel down there and we hauled, we, once a year we did a fuel haul with our vessel. We had a 50 foot motor vessel. We'd take 60 to 70 barrels of av gas and jet fuel, and usually 12 or 15 uh, 100 pound uh, uh, propane cylinders. And I'd haul three, three barrels at a time from Larson Bay over to uh, Carlock Lake. It's about a 10 minute flight. You can see here, um, this uh, thing I've got circled here, this is, this is the gear warning system on this beaver, amphib beaver, it's a mirror. Look in the mirror, see what position the gear's in. And this is the other end on Carlock Lake. Um, we rigged up this uh, pretty basic kind of a skid. Um, we'd slide the barrels over, drop them onto the skid, drop them into the water, and the folks would come around with a skiff and uh, haul them up on dry land. So it was actually a fairly, um, fairly smooth process, but three barrels at a time, it took, usually took three days uh, to get that done. And of course, um, we, at one point, we were refurbishing the quarters on Kodiak and on Carlock Lake. And uh, the boss uh, had three or four sets of these things, these old military bunk beds. And I had hauled a lot of external loads on that beaver. I called uh, Jerry Lawhorn. He was our chief of maintenance uh, in Anchorage. Jerry had a lot of beaver time. I asked him about flying these things on the outside of the airplane because they wouldn't fit through the door. The door on the beaver was designed to take barrels standing upright or laying on their side, but it wasn't designed to take these things and they wouldn't quite go through the door. So I asked Jerry about it and he, his recommendation, he said, well, try one first and see how you like it. So of course I'm out there now I've, I've I procrastinated and there's nothing left to haul down there except these stupid bunk beds. So, um, I, I strapped one on and I was getting ready to go with a stone empty beaver and one set of these things on the side, just, just one on one side. 
And I thought, well, that's really stupid. So I put the other one on the other side. So I took off from runway 28. This is Kodiak State Airport. You go up here through Buskin Pass and you get over to the west side of the island, which gets you closest to uh, Carlock Lake. Um, and I took off and the airplane just literally leaped in the air. So that was good. I'm thinking, oh, okay, that's good. I, the the um, landing gear on this airplane is uh, manual hydraulic. It's got a big, big uh, manual pump. And uh, so I pumped the gear up and then I started, uh, I brought the power back to Mito power, maximum except takeoff power. And I started pumping the flaps up and the airplane started sinking right about here over Coast Guard housing. Well, that wasn't good. So I decided about then, okay, what I'm gonna do is get the flaps back down again. And now I'm gonna turn to the right and go back and land at the airport. Problem was the airplane wouldn't turn. As soon as I started to put in any kind of turning banking inputs, it buffeted really hard. So I didn't want to turn and it didn't really want to climb. And so I didn't really have much choice. And I went over Buskin Pass uh, as low as I could get, which was mostly on the road. Um, and I managed to get over the pass and uh, went all the way down to, to Carlick Lake at, at Mito Power. And so used a bunch of gas, uh, pumped a bunch of gas in down there, came back. And uh, that night I got a phone call from a friend of mine and he said, if you try to run me off the road up there on Buskin Pass again with that big orange airplane, I will call the FAA on you. And I said, and I explained to him what was going on. Next morning, I called Jerry Longhorn up in Anchorage, the maintenance chief. And Jerry, Jerry was always Mr. Understated. And I said, Jerry, tell me more about hauling these, uh, these uh, military bunk beds. And he said, you took two, didn't you? And I said, yeah, I guess I did. So anyway, we had a long conversation and I didn't do that again. And then we uh, uh, sent the rest of the bunk beds down with Hal Derrick, my friend Hal, Hal Derrick, and this gorgeous scrum and goose. Um, and Hal unfortunately passed away. This airplane's still sitting in his inky narrows on the bottom. And Hal was killed with a couple other fellows in terrible weather. Kodiak can be a tough place. And after eight years in Kodiak, I uh, accepted a position in Fairbanks, based in Fairbanks, Alaska, uh, working on the Yukon Flats National Wildlife Refuge, this purple area up here. Um, and um, this is a little closer look at it. You can see it's there's a lot of water out there. This is the Yukon River. Uh, and the Porcupine River coming down out of Canada. This, uh, where the two, uh, where the confluence is on the two rivers is uh, where Fort Yukon uh, resides. And Fort Yukon was the furthest west uh, Hudson's Bay outpost. The, the Hudson's Bay Company actually ran a, a, a fur outpost in Russian territory and the Russians didn't know it. Uh, and they continued to run it after the United States bought Alaska from Russia. So you can see lots of rivers coming down out of the Brooks Range. The Brooks Range is just up here to the north. The White Mountains are to the south. It's a big, just south of the White Mountains, about 40 miles is Fairbanks. Um, I picked up this airplane brand new. It was, a, it was a 1985 airplane, had 22 hours total time on it. Beautiful airplane, Cessna 185, one of the last of the breed. Uh, 1985 was the last model year of the, of the Cessna 185. And uh, so this is kind of a typical um, snowy day out on, on the refuge. Um, uh, C3600 um, fluidine retractable wheel skis. Um, we also used um, this airplane quite a bit later on uh, Aviat Husky, and you can get some idea of what the Yukon Flats looks like from this. It's aptly named, by the way, flat. Huge amount of water out there. Minnesota claims it has 10,000 lakes, a land of 10,000 lakes. This, this place has somewhere around 60,000 water bodies in it. Um, so this is kind of what it looks like. Um, the term uh, that applies to this kind of country is taiga. It's a Russian word uh, for uh, that that means land of little sticks. So these are black spruce trees for the most part. There's some white spruce out there, but mostly black spruce. 
um, muskeggy wet stuff. Uh, and this is very characteristic of the Yukon Flats. This is scenic downtown Fort Yukon. Um, the Porcupine River over here in the upper right is flowing into um, the Yukon River, which is here, makes a turn at, at Fort Yukon. And Hospital Lake, which is a cutoff Oxbow Lake from the Porcupine. It's named Hospital Lake because this is where the polio hospital was um, back in the 50s uh, for much of Alaska. They had a polio hospital there. So this is a <laughs> sign. Welcome to uh, Yukon era. Welcome to you know, Fort Yukon. Which Z is uh, these the people who uh, live here uh, are called Gwich'in Athabascan. They are Indians, not Eskimos. Um, Population is about 680. Lowest temperature minus 76. Highest temperature 105 degrees. Now I don't think that's official, but I think the official high temperature for Fort Yukon is 102 or 103. Anyway. Anybody tells you Alaska doesn't get hot, it does. And again, it's eight miles north of the Arctic Circle. So, minus 76, if anybody tells you that hell does not freeze over, tell them they need to go to Fort Yukon in the winter. So here's the 185 Charlie Alpha, the, that 1985, 185, on a nice warm summer day. You can see I'm dressed a little casually. Um, Carrying external loads, and I did a, a lot of external load uh, carriage over the years. These are uh, PK3500 floats. These are Cs, which are much better floats than the As and Bs. Um, these are uh, 10 to 12 foot um, fiberglass canoes, and they work great, but I, I we had uh, 12 of them, and I moved each one of those canoes probably 12 to 15 times a summer. Um, so I carried a lot of external loads uh, on this airplane, and uh, eventually we we got smart and we we bought some of these folding canoes. This is a 10 to 12 foot folding canoe. It had carried just as much, folds up into a really nice little package that goes inside the airplane, or more specifically, in one of the float lockers. Much better idea. As I said, the Yukon Flats is lots and lots of water body streams. This is, uh, the Yukon Flats is the only portion of the Yukon River that's heavily braided like this. And operating a seaplane up here can be really dicey because it's really difficult. These are big uh, silty rivers and it's really tough to tell how deep you are on any one of these channels. And trying to decide where the main channel is can be a challenge. The reason the Yukon Flats was established was because it's, um, it, it harbors the nesting populations of a huge percentage of the duck populations in the United States. Very few geese nest here, but uh, up to 50 to 60% of some waterfowl species populations nest on the Yukon Flats. And you can see these are band retrievals, band returns um, of birds that were banded on the Yukon Flats all over the United States. So it's a very important uh, waterfowl nesting area. Um, these are white-winged scoters. There was a, one, one winter, there was a big die off these birds winter in, uh, uh, in the Gulf of Alaska. There was a huge die off and they were trying to figure out what was going on with these birds. So there had been only one nesting study ever done on these birds on this species. And that was over in Canada, way deep in the interior of Canada. This is, um, this is a white-winged scoter female on a nest right here. You can see her bill. You can see her eye right there. Um, they're, they're fascinating birds. They nest uh, way deep in the forest. They're big, clumsy sea ducks, so they have difficulty walking. Uh, we, had, we had birds that nested as far as 700 meters from water. Um, and so here's a kind of a typical nest. Uh, and so we had a, um, a graduate student worked on those birds and, and it was a, turned out to be a very good study. Uh, and uh, to the best of my knowledge, there hasn't been a big die off again. Um, they, the scientists down there never figured out what happened. There's thought to be oil uh, in other parts of Alaska, other than the North Slope, by the way. And um, Exxon proposed to do a seismic project on the Yukon Flats. Um, they hired Northern Geophysical 
we laid out the specifications of how they had to do this, which was all surficial. They weren't allowed to do downhole seismic work. Um, and so this is a camp on uh, Cloya Lake, a 200, 200 man camp uh, that was out there from February, about February 1st until the 15th of April. 40 mile air provided a couple of single engine otters. Alaska helicopters provided a couple of helicopters and then the seismic company, Northern Geophysical brought a couple of helicopters with them. Um, they, I was the environmental monitor. And I think I like to think these guys appreciated me a lot because I didn't hang around a lot. Um, mostly because they screwed up on about day three of the project and had a little oil spill. And I happened to be standing right there when it happened. So they kind of got some egg on their face. And as a result, and it was a fairly minor thing, although it cost them dearly, um, but, uh, but the, the net result was uh, from then on, they really worked hard to do this right. And they did that project right. Um, they were very proud of themselves at the end of the day uh, when they finished the project and they had every right to be very proud. They did a great job. So the good news was um, they bought the gas and I worked all over the Yukon Flats uh, uh, learning more about uh, my, my area of expertise. And of course you operate on skis very much and uh, sooner or later you get here and that is uh, stuck. Um, I, um, I was reminded early in my uh, ski flying experience with the 185, I got really bad stuck in overflow and I won't go into the details, but um, it became apparent to me at about five o'clock at night. Uh, and this was, this was in uh, February uh, that it was 35 below zero. And if I didn't get out of there that night, I was probably gonna die out there. I had been really stupid. Uh, and I managed to get the airplane out of the overflow, flew back to town, soaking wet. Um, but I learned, uh, I learned a lot about flying on skis that night. And one of the things I learned is take a lighter airplane. <laughs> and um, the, other, uh, the other learning lesson, one of the other learning lessons was my personal super cub. I broke a gear leg. I hit a, hit a, was operating in flat light. And I actually hold a, a record. Uh, of some kind. Um, this all happened the day after I completed cool school, the Arctic survival training at Eielson Air Force Base. So I got all trained up on how to survive in the Arctic and I uh, went out and broke a gear on my uh, Super Cub and spent the night out at 45 below zero, which was kind of a no big deal because I had just been through the training and I knew exactly what I needed to do. Um, but I prefer not to sleep out at 45 below if I could avoid it. We had lots of neotropical migrant birds. We misnetted these birds. Um, these were uh, really fun projects. We'd, uh, we'd go up uh, late one day. We'd open the nets at 3 a.m. because this is, we're right on the Arctic Circle. This, uh, this cabin we had, this project was right on the Arctic Circle. So we'd start mist netting at three, finish up at about 10, uh, take a nap, until about three and then fly back to Fairbanks the next day. Catching birds like these um, yellow warblers. Um, we had a graduate student, actually one of my coworkers who worked on her graduate uh, on a master's degree on yellow warbler uh, nest ecology, which is pretty good. And this is her. She did a great job. She was a really good birder. There are lots of flying things on the Yukon Flats, by the way, and not all of them have feathers. Uh, so it can be pretty miserable. But as I said, this is a 1985 Cessna 185, picked up 22 hours on, uh, I started flying it on July the 5th, 1986. I arrived in Fairbanks July the 4th, 1986. So I, I took a check ride in this airplane, hadn't flown to 185 in several years, took a check ride in this airplane on July 5th, uh, 86 and went to work and uh, 3,500 flight hours on the airplane. And exactly 10 years later, uh, I parked it on a mountainside after the crankshaft broke. Um, this was July 4th, 1996. So it turns out this airplane apparently had a 10 year warranty um, and we weren't aware of it. Um, 
the crankshaft failed at about, I was at about 6,000 feet or a 5,500 foot ridge north of Fairbanks. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, turned around, headed back downhill and parked it in the only place that wasn't heavily covered with trees. Um, so there you are. The good news is the, the doors opened. Um, you can see that the airplane tumbled uh, and it was kind of a mess. Um, but anyway, I uh, got out of the airplane, waited till the dust settled a little bit, got back in, turned on the master switch and the radio and called on uh, 121.5 and any aircraft, uh, I'm, I need some assistance. And this voice came back and he said, uh, 185 Charlie Oliver, Alpha, this is uh, Japan Air Flight 21 to Tokyo. How may we help you, sir? Uh, and <laughs> so these guys, passed a message on to Fairbanks and got a helicopter dispatched to pick me up. And the next day the helicopter came in and picked up the airplane and brought it back. And, and uh, the good news is that the airplane, the photograph I showed you just before this one is actually taken after this, um, not before. It's, uh, it was actually uh, rebuilt and it's flying again. But anyway, Whip Air was kind enough to put together a very nice uh, U-206F model airplane with an IO-550 engine in it. Um, I did a little survey of our crew there at the Yukon Flats, and um, much to my dismay, they wanted a 206 as opposed to a 185, and it turned out they were way right, and I was way wrong. This is a dynamite airplane, fantastic airplane. As I said, we also used Huskies. Uh, sorry, this is a Super Cub. I'll try not to use the Husky term any more than I have to. Um, German wheel skis on this airplane, fantastic. The best skis of any kind, straight ski or otherwise, that I have ever flown on an airplane. They are phenomenal skis. Very light, 76 pounds total additional weight. Of course, you're running to, uh, 850 by six tires on them as well, but um, you can get into a lot of snow. Um, so, one of the things uh, we discovered was the moose populations on the Yukon Flats were relatively low, and this is a major subsistence species. So following uh, the science, uh, we developed uh, uh, moose surveys, and as a consequence, I wound up participating in moose surveys all over central Alaska, uh, central and northern Alaska, and uh, for the next, oh, I don't know, 12 or 15 years, uh, that was about all I did from uh, first couple of weeks of October on to the end of November. So basically you, uh, you parcel up your area that you're interested in to, into small blocks and you randomly select blocks that are to be intensively surveys and the rest of them you fly through in a four place airplane uh, and you stratify. And I won't get into the details, but this is a typical survey crew. Um, these are folks, both refuge folks. Uh, Andy Greenblatt is a contract pilot. Um, uh, Paul Williams Sr. here was the uh, traditional chief of the Beaver Native Corporation. Um, and I'm on the far right. Jim McCarran was uh, one of my coworkers, super guy. He's an Eskimo from Kotlik, Alaska, which is, uh, he's a, a Yupik Eskimo. Um, so great bunch of folks. This is the 206. We'd use it for stratification, use the Husky and Super Cubs. Uh, Andy Greenblatt uh, owned a Super Cub and was a part 135 operator. So you're flying around low level and you're looking for these folks. Uh, we were, we not only counted the moose, but we also classified them, age classes of males and then females and young, young of the year. Um, we found that the Moose population was, was very low on the Yukon Flats. And as a consequence, again, being scientists, uh, we figured we needed to figure out why. So this is a cow moose, um, used a husky to um, find out if they're cows or bulls because they don't have any antlers. This is in March. Uh, and use a jet ranger to capture them using a, a projectile dart. Um, and by the way, the way you determine whether these are males or females is they have a cloacal, the females have a cloacal white patch under their tail. Um, so if you want to talk about flying low, that's what you do. Um, again, you know, we took blood samples and some various and sundry other kinds of samples. 
put a radio transmitter on on the cows. These cows are the 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 drug you use in these and the dosage you use in these animals is a calming dosage. Basically, they can't move, but they're you can see her ears are alert. She's awake. And I love this picture. This was stolen off the internet, but this is actually at Eilson Air Force Base, and uh, this mama knew where to park, uh, feeding her kid. Um, so uh, we got that project done. Three days, we caught 30 uh, female moose, 30 cows, put radio collars on them, and um, then we came back in May when the, when the cows start uh, calving with two little airplanes and a helicopter. And uh, each morning, we'd get up with the two fixed wing airplanes, and we'd start looking for uh, all our cows. We'd find each cow every day, and we'd circle them, look at them closely enough to determine whether they had calves or not. If they had calves, then we'd call the helicopter crew. Uh, and this is a stock photograph, so it's not the real deal. But this gives you some idea. This is kind of like the stuff we were dealing with. We had two muggers. Um, and uh, uh, one wearing an orange vest, one wearing a yellow vest, helicopter pilot, Joe would bring him in um, and uh, I'd give him a place fairly close to the cow to drop the muggers off. He'd drop the muggers and then he'd bail out and get out of there with the helicopter. I'd walk the muggers in talking to him through earbuds uh, until they were really close, 10 meters or so to the cow and calves. And then I'd have, I'd call Joe on the radio. Joe had come back in and he'd bust the cow off, uh, do a quick stop in her face and run the cow off. Uh, and then uh, the muggers would grab the calves uh, and they'd slip these um, collars on them. These are just an ace bandage basically. So they'd expand and, and after a little bit of exposure to UV, they'd fall off. These get kind of uh, exciting at times. This is Mark Bertram. Uh, he's a mugger with the, the with the yellow vest, and you can see he's wearing a shoulder harness with a 44 Magnum in there. Um, got kind of dicey at times. Uh, there was a period, there was a time where Mark was holding one of these calves, and Jim was looking for the other, and uh, the cow stuck her head out of the trees right behind Mark, about 10 10 feet behind Mark, and and I I got on the radio and I said, Mark, drop the calf and run like hell. And I've never seen anybody move that fast in my life. Uh, but in one case, uh, Mark, uh, one of the guys, I think it was Mark, uh, was actually, uh, the cow had him down and, and Joe came in and bumped her, bumped her with a skid. This is about a two day old calf. We had to catch them before they were four days old. Three day old calves were as good as it got. If they are four, they'll outrun you. Uh, up to about four days, the calves will drop when they're uh, scared they'll just drop and lay down. And so I try to spot the calves and then walk the muggers over to them while Joe was dealing with the cow. This is a quick deal. We, we working with the calves for just a few minutes uh, and then get out of there. What we were trying to find out is what was, what, what was the uh, survival of calves uh, through the first six to eight weeks of life. And it turned out it was pretty poor. 86% uh, of the calves were killed. Um, about half by grizzly bears and about half by black bears, it turned out. We had in the three years that we ran this study each spring, um, we had one uh, calf that was killed by a wolf. Um, all the rest of them that were killed, um, the 86% that were killed were killed by uh, bears. We didn't really know much about the black bears and there are a lot of black bears uh, in Kodiak, or in <laughs> Kodiak, sorry, in the Yukon Flats. So this is Jim Karen again, uh, Mark Bertram again, and we set up snares, caught, caught black bears, uh, put radio collars on the females and started following them around. And again, uh, you're out there with radio telemetry equipment tracking these animals. And in the winter, we'd find the den and go into the snowshoe in, uh, find the den, excavate the, the uh, opening of the den out, uh, it uses this big long painter's pole, extendable painter's pole with a syringe on the end. And very carefully, after we figured out what was bear and what was cub, uh, stick the bear. Mark was the tunnel man. He was 20 years younger than me and I figured not quite as bright as me. Uh, but there were times I had to pull him out by his feet. 
Um, he was braver than me. He'd crawl down the hole with, with a female after she went to sleep. So here's Mark working on a, a female, checking the radio collar, checking her teeth. Um, we um, get these cubs out. These are probably a week old. And golly, they are noisy. They just, you can see they're just singing up a storm. Their eyes are still closed. They don't know what's going on. All they know is they were warm. There was a milk bar and it was dark. Now it's not dark, it's cold, and there's no milk bar. So I'd shove them down the, uh, the, the, out, uh, the inside of my insulated coveralls, and now it's dark, and now it's warm, and they start roaming around looking for the milk bar. And it turns out it'd take them about 20 minutes to realize there is no milk bar in this, in this store. Uh, and then they start screeching again, and by that time we'd have the sow back in the in the den and we'd put the cubs back with her and uh, everything was, life was good again. So the point here is we were counting the cubs, we knew how many cubs were actually born uh, and then we could track them. These are a little older, these are about three weeks old, three to four weeks old. Um, and so we track them. Um, I also worked on uh, uh, helped out over on the Tetlin Refuge some with their uh, wolf predation study, their uh, predator prey study uh, on wolves and moose. Um, lots of different projects going on. Uh, oops, I think I screwed up there. Let me... um, this is a trumpeter swan, and there are a lot of trumpeter swans in uh, Alaska. Um, very few uh, survived in the United States. Um, there's a small population in Yellowstone and down here in Southwest Montana. Um, this is Minto Flats. Here's Fairbanks over here to the right side, the uh, Tanana River, uh, which flows into the Yukon. But these Minto Flats, there were a lot of uh, trumpeter swans over here. And Rod King was a biologist, worked for us. Um, and we worked with some state biologists over here. Um, Fish and Wildlife Service wanted to, wanted to get some swan eggs um, to take to Minnesota, to reintroduce trumpeter swans to Minnesota where they'd been ex extirpated. So um, what we do is we'd arrange with the crew out here that was working on mental flats, the biologists that were working on mental flats, to find the various uh, trumpeter swan nests, flag them, and then on the appointed day, uh, they would go around and take one egg out of each nest this is a trumpeter nest. Uh, they take one egg, typically five, net, five eggs in a nest. Um, and oftentimes one or two of these uh, don't make it anyway. So they grab one egg out of each of the nests and then we pick them up with a float plane and bring them back to Fairbanks International. 3M Corporation was kind enough to donate the use of one of their big jets. And they would fly up from Minneapolis with a Fish and Wildlife Service biologist and an incubator. They'd meet us at Fairbanks International, put the eggs in the incubator, turn around and fly back to Minneapolis. And as a result, there's now a very strong population of trumpeter swans in Minnesota again. Um, so one of the little success stories and who to thunk, uh, I, we moved, Gina and I moved to Minnesota and, and I used to tell people down there, you, want, you know where those swans came from? Well, this is uh, Rick Swisher in his R44 helicopter. Uh, this is a gravel bar on Beaver Creek. Uh, we're out catching doll sheep. The last project I worked on um, before I retired from Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, we were catching doll sheep. This is a net gun. It projects uh, 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 lead weights out uh, and uh, drags a net out over a sheep. This is uh, Rocky Mountain sheep, but anyway, get the idea. And so um, we were catching sheep and I had a crew take a, a several barrels of fuel on a long, long road that's north of Fairbanks, about 40 miles north of Fairbanks. And there's this campground here, a BLM campground. And we're catching sheep back over here to the upper left uh, around Mount Prindle. And uh, so we just put the barrels down here at the end of this uh, campground and they're little spaces for campers that go off that main road here uh, and figured we could land there. It's about a thousand feet. And uh, so I figured I could land there and, and all as well. Now this is in the fall, it's snow on the ground. Um, and um, 
this is what it looked like. Uh, and you don't really expect to see a camper out there, but sure as heck, um, first time I come down here to get fuel, and now I need fuel, first time I come down here to get fuel, there is a motorhome parked right smack in the middle of this, this campground on the main road. He didn't pull into one of the little camp spaces. He's parked in the middle of the road. So now I've got about 500 feet. <laughs> and so I thought, okay, well, I got to have gas. and I gotta... So I landed in there and these tourists were taking pictures the whole time. And they thought this was really cool. And so I went and chatted with them and said, hey, would you mind kind of moving off my airport? <laughs> he said, we thought this was a campground. No, no, this is an airport now. Anyway, they were really nice, but we caught the sheep. Um, the whole time um, I was worked for Fish and Wildlife Service, I was a law enforcement officer. I worked with state troopers, these couple of state trooper airplanes in mine um, at Canvasback Lake in the middle of the Yukon Flats. Uh, we did uh, trapper checks, uh, stop in, just, just hi, how are you, kind of visits with the trappers out on the Yukon Flats. You can see this is the uh, Yukon Flats Hilton. Um, and people look at these doors. This is a small cabin, um, but this is uh, this guy's living in here all winter and in very cold temperatures. The reason this door is so big is when it's 60 below out and your snow machine isn't working, you need to be able to drag it into the cabin to work on it. So they all these trappers cabins have these big doors on them. We had seven villages uh, on the Yukon Flats, Venitai, Chalkitsik, or Yukon, Birch Creek, Circle, Beaver, Stevens Village. And I went into all of these villages at various times and did uh, school programs for the kids. Um, those kids were, most of them were really great to work with. And Chalkitsik had had a big shootout not long before I moved to uh, the Yukon Flats. I was coming down from Old Crow, which is up here in the, off the far right hand corner. I was coming down back from Old Crow and uh, I had to pee really bad and it was in April. And Chalkitic was really the closest place. It was pretty much right on a straight line. And I'd heard all kinds of stories from the troopers and others uh, about going into Chalkitic. It'd be a pretty rough place. So I thought, well, whatever. So I swung around and I was landing. It's April, so you couldn't, the, the lake ice was rotten um, and there were no gravel bars. So um, I swung around, I'm on downwind. And I look over, and there's three four wheelers coming up to the, uh, coming up to the the airport on the airport road. And I thought, oh great, now I'm going to have an audience. And I really had to pee, so I landed and I pulled up onto the ramp. And one of these young men, late 20s, early 30s, pulled his four wheeler right in front of the airplane before I had even stopped, and it kind of scared me. And I pulled the mixture to idle cut off. And he was right in, right in my door as I opened my door. And the other two guys were kind of standing back a little ways. And, and he says, um, he got right in my face and he said, what you doing in our village? And I said, I came here to pee and I'll do it on your leg if you don't get out of my way. And he kind of panicked. Um, the other two guys started laughing and they were yelling at him saying, I think he's serious, run, you better run. Well, anyway, it turned out these guys, these three guys were just bored to tears and um, they figured they'd pick a fight and it just didn't work. And it turned out I'd probably said exactly the right things um, purely by chance. Um, and uh, turned out these three guys, I, I stood there and talked to these guys for a good three hours. Um, and when they left, they said, hey, if you need anything in this village, you look one of us up. Um, and for the 20 years I was there, um, those guys were pretty good friends. And I never had any problems at Jockey Ticket. Uh, so they're good people. Lots of fires. Um, 1988 was the year that uh, Yellowstone burned. Um, Yellowstone burned 770,000 acres total that year. Before the Yellowstone fire started, uh, we burned 1.2 million acres on, on the Yukon Flats. And nobody ever heard of that. Um, we, um, one of the really good tools um, that we discovered and started using was uh, satellite phones. These things are magic. 
uh, one day I had a crew out, uh, Mark and, uh, and Jim McCarron were out on the Yukon Flats and I needed to go pick them up. I was overdue picking them up. Smoke was bad and I knew it was bad, but I didn't know how bad. So I went into the office and I checked my email first thing in the morning and here's a picture they had sent me via their satellite phone. And it pretty much said everything I needed to know about whether I was gonna fly up there that day or not. Uh, and <laughs> did it with a little humor. Um, we had uh, these fish in the Yukon. Um, these are in canoe or she fish. Beautiful, big, beautiful fish, 22 to 25 pound fish. Randy Brown um, put radios in a bunch of them and we tracked them all over interior Alaska. This is Mount McKinley or Denali. Um, this, is, this is the South Summit. Uh, we did some training up there. Uh, I was fortunate enough to, to fly with Jay Hudson and uh, he who's flown up there for years and years and years and his dad had flew up there since 1948 um, and um, had some good experience learning to fly up there and did quite a bit of training in various environments, uh, bringing new pilots on. Uh, they didn't have to learn the way I learned, which uh, in large part was just taking check rides and figuring things out sometimes the hard way. Um, so I had to show you another Super Cub. This is my Super Cub, and this Super Cub is wearing these colors. Again, they've recovered it, but it's in Anchorage now. And that's, uh, that's my dream airplane in the back, 1822 Mike uh, C-46, Curtis C-46. They delivered 14,500 pounds of building materials on lake ice to uh, my cabin site down southwest Fairbanks. This is my uh, 170 on floats that I had for many years. The first airplane I had was a J3, 90 horse J3 on floats. And uh, this is the PA-11 at JC, uh, at uh, Johnson Creek. And we had another weird airplane. Uh, I didn't fly very much. I flew it a little bit and that's a 754. This is a standard Beaver that had uh, one of those Garrett engines stuck on the front of it. A wild airplane, tremendous amount of power. And I just wanted to mention this. Um, this is uh, the, the fellow on the right in the picture on the left is Jorgi Jorgensen, Holger Jorgensen. And this book on the right is about Jorgi's life. And it's a fantastic book. Jorgi just passed away a few weeks ago. And that's uh, Tim Berg on the left. He posts on supercop.org as Mitt Greb. Uh, so anyway, two good guys. Uh, Jorgi was just a wealth of great stories. And the Alaskans are just a really class act. They're a lot of fun to be around. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed my 30 years in Alaska. And uh, I'd probably go back, but I'm, I'm liking Montana too. I grew up in Montana. So this is a husky sitting on a gravel bar in Beaver Creek, uh, getting late in the day. So I guess thanks for showing up. Sorry it took so long. Mike, that was fantastic. Awesome. Oh my gosh. <laughs> You can unshare your screen. Okay, the, uh, how do I? Uh, up at the top, there'll be a little here, spot right there. <laughs> that was incredible. I mean, what? Geez, you know, and you can't hear us chuckling at you either, unfortunately. <laughs> so you're not getting the feedback. But that was that was really great. That there are some folks that have some questions, um, and uh, the first question uh, from Peter Thompson was, uh, uh, "Did you use ketamine to trans?" To tranquilize the moose and he's an anesthesiologist so he was curious. Yes um, we used to, I, to tell you the truth I can't remember the other the rest of the cocktail but the, but the cocktail with the primary ingredient was ketamine. Yeah um, so uh, if anybody has any questions they want to ask Mike you can use the little hand raise function in zoom as well too um, and then we'll uh, although you know I mean you really covered everything. That was that was uh, pretty phenomenal. You know, I um, the 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 experience with the wildlife. I got to assume that the that the work that they're doing up there now is probably different than what you did all those years ago. No, not really. Um, actually, I here about a month ago, I was talking to Mark Bertram, the fellow that um, I worked with a great deal. He's still working at the Yukon Flats. They've been working for several years on a uh, project on Canada lynx. 
um, on the Yukon Flats, and they've had some just remarkable. He was telling me some of the stories. Um, so they went out in the dead of winter and trapped uh, lynx out there on the Yukon Flats, and uh, those cats have moved all over Alaska. They are they're it, it would it would be they put uh, satellite uh, trackers on them uh, as opposed to trying to find them with the airplane. Uh, so uh, we have a question uh, from the YouTube stream, Mike. Somebody wants you to tell about your 175. Oh yeah, I have a 175 now. It's a uh, tailwheel converted, uh, has an O360. It's a nice airplane. Um, it, uh, I, I had that 170 with a 180 horse engine for, for, for almost 20 years, I guess. Um, and I kind of expected the 175 to be similar and it's not as much as I had thought. The performance is good. Um, it's not nearly as light on the controls of the 170. So it flies like a little heavier airplane, which is not all bad because the 170 is really light on the controls. Um, so I'm like, you know, I tell people, why did you get rid of the PA-11 and buy a 175? And I, I needed a bigger cooler, you know? So a uh, couple other questions here. I'm just going to read off here. Um, so how would you recommend uh, getting involved with uh, being a pilot for the uh, NWS, for the, for the National Wildlife Service? Um, well, there are a couple of different categories of pilot positions. Um, and uh, Henny, uh, the fellow who posts as Henny here, um, works for the Forest Service. And they've been going through a similar kind of thing. Their pilots are called 2181, that's a job series. I was an 0486. The 0486 is a wildlife biologist. Um, the 2181 is full-time pilots, um, and that's your sole duties. And that can work okay, but the problem is a lot of times in, in many of these positions, you don't fly as much as you might as an air taxi pilot, for example. So some people get a little discouraged by that. But if you're going to be a wildlife biologist or a refuge manager or a park ranger, um, you're probably going to need a, a, a college degree. Uh, the law enforcement is the one thing that, that doesn't require a college degree. And then be a dual function pilot, what they call a dual function pilot. So I was a wildlife biologist. I moved to Alaska specifically to get into flying airplanes. At the time I went up there, um, there were 16 airplanes, Fish and Wildlife Service airplanes based in the lower 48 and 38 in Alaska. So you need to go where, you know, where the action is, go where the jobs are. And that's why I went to Alaska initially. But um, college degree in wildlife or something like that, get on with the agency, however, however you have to get on with the agency, often as a temporary first, and then get on full time and then start looking for that pilot job once you have the pilot qualifications as well. Well, you're, you're getting lots of great comments and lots of appreciation for doing this. And there's another question here too, which I'll throw in. It says, uh, were the RF skis durable enough? Oh, the, uh, the skis, absolutely. Um, I worked them pretty hard. Um, I, I mean, I only ran them, I think four or five winters. Um, I think it, it, you have to understand that, that that part of the world is characterized by really deep, typically pretty fluffy snow, uh, except the one that I hit with my gear, uh, my gear leg on the cub, of course, but um, it, it's, you're typically operating in really deep, really fluffy snow. So it's, uh, you float. Uh, I think if you took a set of those skis out onto the West Coast of Alaska, where the, the snow is really wind blown and hard packed, um, you, you could probably tear them up. But I mean, I've, I've, uh, I know guys who've torn up uh, Landa skis, um, the, the air glass skis. I know guys who've torn up uh, fluidines. <laughs> it's, it's quite possible. The beauty of these skis, they were perfect for what I was doing. Um, and the, like I say, the really nice thing is they were retractable wheel skis that weighed 70 a little over 72, 74 pounds, something like that, additional weight, as compared to the C2200s, which we had on our other Huskies, um, and those are 120 pounds additional. 
Well, Mike, thank you again so much for for uh, spending this time with us this evening and uh, and uh, and and giving us all this awesome information and great photos <laughs> and just sharing this part of your life. Uh, you know, it's funny because we've done uh, this being the third one and the next two actually are also on Alaska. So the, it's not really the theme of this deal, but it's just worked out that that five, uh, the first five presentations are going to be about Alaska. So, but it's really, obviously there's a lot to talk about up there and, and uh, you know, this was really fantastic. Uh, folks, if you know other people that might be interested in seeing this, you can uh, give them the link. The YouTube link will be the same. It'll, it's all been recorded on YouTube. And uh, so if they want to watch it again, they can certainly do that. Uh, check in uh, check in with us next Wednesday night and Wednesday nights following. We hope to keep doing this for as long as uh, people want to show up and we got people to present to us. So thank you again, Mike Vivian. Thanks, Mike. Yeah. And hey, come on out to Montana. Um, the governor says uh, things are going to start to lift uh, the, the shutdown on Monday. Um, and I'm really sincerely hoping that the Missouri breaks uh, fly in will be a go. So I know um, we hope to see you there. We're we're, uh, we're keeping our fingers crossed, but uh, right now it looks good. But you know, yeah. <laughs> as we said, well, if if that doesn't work, uh, you know, stop by Bozeman, get in touch, uh, and uh, always glad to talk to people, visit with people, and and uh, see fellow aviators. So Bozeman's a pretty nice place in itself. It is. Sure is. Well, thanks again. And thanks again, everybody who tuned in both on YouTube and Zoom. And uh, we look forward to seeing you all next week. Good night now. Good night.